industry self-governance. Um, I'm going to try to make it as interactive as possible. We've got some great panelists who are going to give short opening statements, but I promise short so that we can bring everyone in uh, and make, make this a debate rather than a long series of presentations. Um, just, very, just one minute from me, very briefly, to remind you of the, the, the theme of the, the, the panel. Um, as you all know, I'm sure, uh, multi-stakeholder governance with, with the IGF as the, the principal example, but combined with industry self-regulation uh, with a greater or lesser degree in different cases of government involvement has been the, the default model so far of internet regulation. That has some advantages in terms of speed of action, in bringing in technical expertise from the industry, in getting commitment from industry players to the solutions. But of course, the, 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 the big question that self-regulation on its own leaves open is how do you ensure that proper uh, consideration is given to the public good very broadly drawn? I don't mean public goods in the, economy, in the economic sense, I mean uh, values like accountability and so on. Uh, who makes sure that those are um, given proper attention? That, that has tradition, traditionally uh, been the role, um, most importantly, of the, legis the legislator uh, and of the process of passing laws that have uh, input from all stakeholders. You know, this is the idealized model of legislating. I'm not saying in practice things always work this way, um, but that you have democratic consensus and agreement through, through people's representatives in parliaments in passing laws. Clearly that has issues on a global scale and particularly with the, the, the cross-jurisdictional issues raised by the internet. Um, what, can we, what lessons can we draw from some of the existing cases of, of to some extent, self-regulation about protecting and enhancing the public good uh, that, that complement or, or not entirely replace, but to some extent replace that legislative and, and government more, broad, more broadly role. Um, we're going to look at three cases, but we're going to range much more broadly than that because our, our speakers have expertise in, in a very wide range of these areas. Uh, so in particular, um, of course, ICANN, there's, there's been discussion from the beginning, uh, even before, of course, the creation of ICANN over um, input from governments and other representatives of the public interest, whether that's through bodies like the Government Advisory Committee, whether that's through the affirmation of commitments that ICANN has, has given, uh, whether that's specific issues like the, uh, the, the, the consideration of privacy given in who is in ICANN. Uh, a particularly interesting, more purely private party uh, case of, of Google Books, where Google initially, as you know, uh, was, was mainly relying on fair, the fair use provisions of US copyright law to say we can go and scan and then index uh, books. And then later Google negotiated, very, negotiated settlements with a very large number of parties, huge number of people getting involved, including the, the French the French and German governments filing uh, Friends of the Court briefs uh, and ultimately uh, in one court decision the court famously has, has said that these are issues that the court thought needed a broader public consideration of which Congress really should be doing rather than private self-interested in the, in the, the technical, not the moral, moralizing sense, um, was able to do in a, in a settlement of that sense. And then finally, uh, of the case studies looking at, the, and this is where governments have been involved, but not in the, the traditional legislative way, uh, in, in voluntary and quotes, in putting pressure on companies to provide uh, user communications and data um, to governments f that is held outside the jurisdiction. And in particular, we're going to, to look at what happened in India because we have a, an expert with us on that subject. But of course, that is, that is a topic that crosses a number of countries. Please feel free to, to bring in your examples uh, that, that you found interesting. I will just very briefly introduce the panelists and then go straight to them. Um, so our first speaker on my right, Max Sengers from uh, Google, who's been involved in the IGF since the beginning, Max? Since, yep. Yep. Um, before the, before the beginning of the IGF, uh, was chair of the Dynamic Coalition on Internet Rights and Principles and, and um, I guess is, is one of your main rules, roles at Google is getting involved in multi-stakeholder debate and interacting with civil society groups and other participants in, in this debate. And Max is going to give a, a, a higher level short introduction uh, on some of these issues. Uh, then secondly, uh, to Max's right is Jeanette Hoffman from the Social Science Research, Research Center in Berlin and has uh, been setting up over the last 18 months, Jeanette, um, 
is co and is co-director of the Humboldt Center for Internet and Society. And Jeanette's done a lot of research recently on that Google Books case, so we'll partially talk about that, but, but again, partially broaden out uh, on there. Then we have um, three experts uh, in particular for, for today on the ICANN case. We have Fiona Alexander from the NTIA at the US Department of Commerce, uh, who was involved in the negotiations of the affirmation of commitments uh, that ICANN have given, and is, uh, are you running the, the policy task force, Fiona, or heavily involved in the, po the Department of Commerce? Co-running the, the Department of Commerce Internet Policy Task Force, um, followed by Emily Taylor, uh, who is an internet governance consultant. She was chair of the Who Is Review team um, that was one of the reviews under the Affirmation of Commitments and also recently authored a report for UNESCO and URID on international domain names. Uh, Bill Drake, uh, sim from the media division at the University of Zurich, again, uh, like most of our speakers, has been involved in the IGF and ICANN uh, since since the beginning, um, since before before the dawn of internet <laughs> governance time. And then last but not least, to my left, Pranesh Prakash, who is the policy director at the Center for Internet Society at Bangalore um, and, and commenter and analyst of, of Indian government um, action in this particularly with some high-profile cases in the media, such as with RIM and Blackberries. So I've asked each of our speakers just to give a short three to five minute opening statement of what, what they see are the key questions raised by these, these varying forms of internet self-governance, multi-stakeholder governments, and then we'll go straight out to uh, the people in the room and hopefully rem our remote participants. Dazira Imlosovic, who is being our remote moderator, is just a couple of moments late, but uh, should be here <laughs> any second. Oh, she's here. She just arrived to zero. Thank you. You got here just in time. Um, and so uh, over to Max. Hello. Good afternoon. Um, thanks for the intro. And um, as mentioned, um, I have prepared some notes on the Google Book case, but uh, I'd like to take it more as an example for um, what we are talking about. And that is uh, disruptive innovation. Um, internet-based disruptive innovations. That means by um, <coughs> definition that they're disrupting something and that is uh, a current state of play. And uh, usually that also means that uh, the current legal system is not 100% um, able to uh, grasp them directly or at least it needs interpretation and it's not as easy to, to categorize them. And I think um, the, the question on how that process can be organized and uh, how to allow that to happen is uh, what I'd focus um, on with my um, uh, comments. So um, <coughs> regarding Google Books, I think um, the precedent in this case is uh, that um, Google was trying to um, make millions out of print books um, and in copyright books available um, uh, on um, a fee or free with ad support basis, basically um, trying to um, move the elephant of making these um, orphanated um, uh, works av um, available. And um, the attempt that um, was negotiated um, was, as um, Ian correctly said, not accepted in its current form. So um, the negotiations are still ongoing and there's also litigation going on. So um, I'm sure you all understand that um, we'd not like to comment too deeply on that case, but rather speak in um, general terms and how these kind of um, opportunities and innovations can be made uh, possible in an effective and um, fast way. Um, maybe let me um, um, point you to one interesting analysis um, of the potential market for out-of-print books done by uh, Michael D. Smith uh, from the Carnegie Mellon University. Um, they assess that um, an opportunity of uh, 460 million um, for, uh, for uh, publishers and authors in the first year is basically going away because um, we don't um, have that market developed. Uh, not to speak of, of course, um, the pure utility of the information being available and accessible to people in the first place. But um, as said, I think um, Google is, uh, has a track record of doing that kind of innovation. When you think about uh, projects like uh, Google Art, um, we have another dilemma that is um, Google is, of course, interested to make that uh, information as freely available as possible, but in fact, it's the museums and the um, <coughs> memory, uh, the archives that um, somehow have uh, um, attached uh, some um, uh, interest and um, 
many also commercial interests and they actually even though they are many most of them or many of them are publicly funded institutions hold on to their copyrights and don't want to make uh, that artwork um, available on a completely open basis but uh, maintain some rights another um, interesting uh, point in case is um, the Google Street View debate that was uh, very fiercely had in, in Germany where basically in the end Google said okay um, you know if there is some unrest we allow people to opt out so um, we had a long period where or I think it was three months where people could opt out um, a substantial number of people even though not as many as you would think when you um, had the press cycle which uh, happened to fall into the summer hole where there was not much news so um, you know, all of that uh, was maybe a special uh, condition, but nevertheless, um, it's it's an example of what happens because once um, the uh, pictures and the service got online, we had thousands of people complain about how ugly it looks with all these um, houses blurred and people complaining that, you know, they hadn't um, agreed that their house is blurred, but somebody else in the house had sent a letter and uh, I don't know how many, um, you know, local uh, discussions and debates uh, people had and fallouts because of that. Um, another very obvious example, and um, you know, maybe that gets us going in the right direction of um, how do we tackle this type of problem, is um, the experiments and uh, the pilot project that Google is running with the self-driving cars. Um, I think um, everybody sees uh, the need to come up with a legal framework and how a car can drive without a driver. Um, and, uh, you know, this is something that Google has engaged in right now and um, the first steps have been taken in Nevada, um, Florida and California. Um, the right to operate the car um, by Google, so that's very different from um, being able to sell it or anything else. But right now we, are, we just have the um, right to, to test it basically. And I think, um, you know, this is the first time that uh, the company is looking into uh, an, a cycle of uh, several years. I think, um, you know, five and more years is, is usually not the, the Google time scale that we think about when we try to bring an innovation to the market. But in this case, um, we do see the need to um, really go through um, the, the rigid process. And uh, it would be nice to, um, you know, use that then as a model case and maybe find better ways to <laughs> accelerate that kind of process because um, obviously um, yeah, it would be nice to benefit from these kinds of innovations. So um, on a more general level, I think um, you know, uh, there, there's several um, examples of uh, disruptive innovations like the internet um, making um, landline telecommunication um, services um, in its current form more and more um, a thing, a, a, a utility of the past. So um, obviously you, you have reactions from um, the um, uh, incumbents, from the um, uh, existing market players. You had the same when um, carriages were overtaken by the automobile, of course, uh, candle makers and um, and uh, light bulbs and electricity is, is another example. So this is a re reoccurring pattern and I think that this um, eruptive power or the creative destruction that uh, companies and entrepreneurs bring to the table is um, uh, what we are talking about, how to frame that in a way that, as you said, um, it serves the public interest in the uh, best way. Maybe one more uh, example on that side, um, and that goes in the direction um, that seems to be rather uncontroversial, and that is uh, Google is working on technology to make a direct translation um, possible. And uh, I don't know whether you have tried the service, um, you might have tried uh, Google Translate as such, it's getting better, but it's certainly not there. But one uh, very important aspect of that is that, of course, you need as much data as possible in order to develop these services. So does the old concept of data minimization still hold true in a context where you want to develop these kind of, um, I believe everybody agrees, useful tools? And with that, I open it up. Thanks. Could you switch your mic off, Max? Thank you. That, that, that's wonderful, and, and we, we've We've had a, a related discussion in the UK on copyright and data mining as well on the, the Google, Google Translate. You know, do, do, do companies need specific copyright permission f um, to do that, to do that kind of text mining? So that's, that's, and I love the Google Cars example as well as something to think through. So, Jeanette. Yeah, um, thank you, Ian. Uh, like Max, I want to address the topic of Google Books from a broader perspective and not talk so much about Google Books as um, um, its implications. 
but I look at it from a completely different angle than Max does. What matters to me uh, with regard to Google Books is the way markets for cultural goods are changing. We used to have two ways of accessing as users Google Books. We would either buy tangible copies of books and or we would sort of buy access, like when we see a movie. We would go to a theater, uh, buy a ticket and get access to the movie. Or we go to a concert, we buy a ticket and we buy a service. And what happens, um, particularly because of digitization, is that one of these two models, <coughs> namely buying tangible goods, seems to die out. And the only uh, model that survives is buying access in a way buying a service and this I would say Google Books is a primary example of what that actually means we could see a lot of this example because it is um, part of a settlement and therefore all the contracts the whole business model was accessible we could look at all the vision the ideas the negotiations actually the results of the negotiations between Google um, the publishers and the authors association and we could in a way see uh, tomorrow's business model of how to set up a mixture of a commercial library and a bookshop and what I find important about the change we see here that goods tangible goods turn into services is what it means for the relationship between sellers and the demand side or the customers in this respect. I would say that customers lose a lot of the rights that they are actually, that they are used to. For example, if you buy a book, you can read it several times, you can share it with your friends, you can resell it, you can do all sorts of things with it because copyright, uh, large parts of it are exhausted with the transaction of buying a book and this is not longer the case when we buy licenses when we buy licenses there is no exchange of property rights the seller keeps the rights and the sellers um, uh, contract uh, licensing contract determines what we as users can do with uh, the license with the good we uh, bought access to. And this means that we see in the long run a real shift in the power balance between sellers and buyers. We have seen now many cases where this has caused problems. For example, I rem remember a case, um, several cases actually with regard to Amazon where users lost access to the books they had bought for various reasons, mainly because they violated the terms of contract. For example, what seems to be quite a common issue is that people who try to buy access to goods that are not available in the country where they live and they try to set up a fake, con um, uh, a f a fake uh, account in another country might lose access to all what they've ever bought because they violated an important um, uh, element of the terms of contract. I think this is um, a problem that perhaps not is not um, possible to relate in terms of uh, self-governance. I think this is a consumer rights issue that needs to be taken up through consumer policies. It's not bad as such that we buy access instead of goods. Actually, it makes our life in many cases really easier because it's easier to transport goods. But we need to make sure that there are sort of certain rights of uh, consumers are protected and that it's not just the seller, uh, the private entity that sets the rules for these uh, markets. Thank you. Thanks, Jeanette. So a, a, a great example there of where perhaps the, that traditional the consumer policy, consumer law might be the best way to protect the public interest. So now on to Fiona. So a little bit of a different topic from Google Books. Um, just to talk a little bit about some of the experiences that um, we've had in the United States and at the Department of Commerce, a couple of things that um, we've been working on. So as a matter of course, I think we've gotten away in the United States from using the phrase self-governance, though, or industry self-governance. 
um, which used to be all the parlance in the late 90s, I think, when ICANN was uh, first created by stakeholders. And we tend to sort of use the phrase multi-stakeholder now. Um, but I think it has a, it's a very similar uh, um, connotation in some cases. So uh, with respect to ICANN, as the relationship with ICANN evolved over time and um, the ICANN system was developed and created, in uh, 2009, when we sort of finalized that part of our relationship um, and sort of cemented it with a long-lasting document, we negotiated with ICANN something called the Affirmation of Commitments. And what the affirmation basically does is it takes a role that people perceive the U.S. government to have that we didn't necessarily actually follow through on in many cases or have, but we uh, created a way for the international community and all the different stakeholders to evaluate ICANN's progress. So um, in the affirmation of commitments, ICANN commits to act in a certain way. Um, the U.S. government through the Department of Commerce commits to support a certain model as long as it acts in a certain way, in this case ICANN. And the operative part of the document is actually these multi-stakeholder review teams. And so it sets the, the foundation and a framework for uh, a team made up of stakeholders from around the world and from the different parts of the ICANN community to review ICANN's accountability and transparency to review ICANN's commitment to security and stability of the DNS. And then it has two policy issues that had plagued ICANN for many years, one being the who is uh, issue, which Emily will speak to, because she was on that review team. And the, the fourth review team um, was if and when there was a new GTLD program, which obviously we've passed that hurdle of if and when. Uh, if and when there was a new GTLD program, a review of that program, and some particular things to take into account in that review. So in, in that... Um, you know, framework and construct or construct of the affirmation, it really is sort of a, a shift in terms of, uh, of of governance, I guess, of the ICANN model from what was perceived as a U.S. government role to the international community and stakeholders. And I think what continues to, to challenge ICANN and, and even this model is accountability in this model. So the uh, first review team, which was the accountability and transparency review team, included stakeholders uh, from different parts of ICANN, including governments. It included the head of our agency, who's always on that review team. It included government officials from the European Commission and from China and from Egypt, as well as stakeholders from South America and um, from um, Africa and Asia. And that, that group came up with 27 recommendations. Um, and in ICANN time, the review team only took nine months, which is quick in ICANN time for, for reviews. Um, and you know, 27 recommendations that went out for comment, the board adopted, and we're still seeing them slowly being implemented with some still to be done. And I think that's one accountability tool. The, the next um, uh, process or the next group of this review team meets again actually in January. And I should have said at the outset that the, uh, the review team model and the affirmation itself is a long-lasting document that never expires. So these reviews happen every three to four years, depending on the issue. They, they cycle a little bit differently. So every three years, there'll be a group of stakeholders um, that get together and review ICANN's execution of its own tasks, specifically on accountability and transparency. Um, the other, the other uh, construct of this model is that the accountability and transparency review team, um, from now on, also reviews ICANN's implementation of the other review team's recommendations to make sure it's accountable. So this is a new and evolving model. I think, you know, there are uh, folks that there probably could be tweaked, there could be criticisms of it, but as with all things with ICANN, it's always an evolving and growing and changing model. Um, another way that we're using this uh, construct in the United States is domestically through uh, pri uh, commercial data privacy. So in uh, February or March, the White House uh, issued um, in the Obama administration, which I guess is continuing now, um, issued a you can apply. Let's work there. Um, issued a, uh, a a framework for um, or sorry, a white paper for commercial data privacy, and in that framework, there's a couple of key components. Uh, one was the uh, creation of multi-stakeholder processes to develop uh, indus develop codes of conduct. Um, the ability for our Federal Trade Commission to enforce these codes of conduct once uh, they were actually developed by stakeholders. Uh, the paper also calls for a baseline domestic uh, privacy legislation, and something called a Privacy Bill of Rights that, that we established. And then the fourth component of that is international interoperability, recognizing that um, with respect to electronic commerce and with respect to um, cross-border data flows, if you don't have uh, regimes that are similar across the world, it's a very limited utility feature of that. So uh, we've kicked off, um, I think domestic legislation is slow to move in the United States, but we're continuing to work and have been working on that a little bit. Um, and we've kicked off our multi-stakeholder uh, codes of conduct process, and you can participate online from anywhere in the world. Um, there have been several meetings, and I think uh, there's some been, been some challenges to the process whereby 
we opened it up to everybody and got stakeholders together and said, how do you want to handle this? And repeatedly, um, we've been criticized for not telling people what to do. And we repeatedly said our role as NTIA and as government is to convene stakeholders, not to establish the rules or tell you what to focus on or tell you what to do. And it's been a little bit of a slow start, but I think that the group is now sort of getting itself together. And uh, they're looking at a specific code of conduct with respect to mobile apps. Um, I, we're looking at... Um, in the future convening other codes and we we'll probably will be having multiple processes running at the same time but it really has been an interesting um, experience to watch you know in the in international community we, we've had a lot of experience with the te five years of the WISIS process and working with stakeholders and in the Internet Governance Forum and in the ICANN community but then for us to try to apply this in a domestic context has been interesting to watch our domestic stakeholders who aren't as familiar with some of this as you to have the challenges of 10 years ago that the international community has faced. And so there's just a couple of things that we're doing um, in NTIA. Wonderful. Thanks, Fiona. And I think we also, in the discussion, might come back to a related um, topic of do not track, which the, the U.S. government and the European Commission have been encouraging industry and, and broad, a broad stakeholder group to set standards, and it's become extremely fractious. So uh, people might have thoughts on that. Um, and so uh, next over to Emily. Thank you very much, Ian. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm also going to speak uh, to uh, the ICANN issue, and in particular to uh, the experience of uh, chairing the affirmation of commitments, who is review. Um, I, I think as Ian described in his opening remarks, the wisdom of uh, letting a developing market and industry regulate itself at first, because it, it's very challenging and, and probably unwise to try and regulate a stream as it's running, as you, you don't know what the issues are going to be until they start to emerge. Now, um, it, it, Fiona, in her remarks, described uh, the, the, the labeling of ICANN. You know, when ICANN uh, started up, it was about um, private sector management. That was the buzz term. And then it rebranded into multi-stakeholder. But I would say, having been through the WHOIS review, that the vestiges of that original structure and construct are definitely there at the core of ICANN. Um, and it, it, it brings to the fore, I think it links with some of the concerns that Janet was raising about, you know, private sector uh, management is very good, as Ian said, if you have you have the practical advantage of the industry there at the table is always practically orientated you have the buy-in you have the funding and so on but uh, Janet raised the flag for if private entities are just setting the rules of the game that raises public interest concerns and I think those do come to the fore and are encapsulated in the issue of who is. Now, for a more general audience, I don't think it, you'll be relieved to hear. I'm not going to explain what who is is or how it works. If we could just start to understand it in terms of what it, what it means for successful self-governance. It is a really nice barometer for that because it is not really useful for the industry. It is viewed as a cost. It is used instead by people who are not within the charmed circle of the multi-stakeholder governance group, typically law enforcement, and uh, although they are present in the ICANN community, the, uh, those enforcing intellectual property rights. We did a study in the WHOIS review team. We found that consumers don't use WHOIS and mostly haven't heard of it. Um, okay, so in a way, this is a nice barometer of this. Is this... Is this construct, is what is what used to be called the ICANN experiment, is this actually serving and delivering on the public interest? Well, this is an issue, as, as Fiona said, that has dogged ICANN and remained unresolved for 12 years. So that tells us something. We also know, because it's there for all to see, that this issue has been tackled very successfully and the competing and legitimate interests balanced successfully in other areas. You just have to look at the European country code uh, top level domains, their, their implementations are far from perfect, but they satisfy, in other words, they, they, they make everybody equally unhappy, whether you're law enforcement or a, a, an, an individual. 
So we know it's one, it's been deadlocked in this multi-stakeholder environment or private sector management or whatever rose by any other name would smell so sweet and it has been solved elsewhere. So why is it not working in ICANN? And I think we all need to ask ourselves those hard questions. I think it comes, the issues that this raises are of the legitimacy of the process. That's what the affirmation of, their, of commitments is there to do. It is there to legitimise what would otherwise cause concern. And unless the organisation actually takes those reviews seriously, and implements the findings where those are made, or uh, at a minimum responds to those findings <coughs> in a coherent and reasoned way, then I think that we will continue to find critics of this interesting experiment have grist to the mill. They have ammunition in which to fight this successful model. So I'll leave it there. Thanks, Emily. So some important, um, very important practical questions about how, how pro this process is working in one specific case, I'm sure, which I'm sure Bill will have something to say about. Does that make you? Use that one. Can you hear me? Sorry. Wasn't ready to be called on. I thought I... Um, <laughs> Okay, um, well, thank you, Yin. Um, having spent uh, three hours this morning uh, co moderating main session on critical internet resources, in which we talked about uh, the World Conference on International Telecommunications, which gave me and others ample opportunity to say pissy things about top down bureaucratic intergovernmental regulation. Oh, I left out heavy handed. Heavy-handed. I'll, <laughs> I'll now say something pissy about bottom-up, bureaucratic, uh, heavy-handed self-regulation <laughs> as well, <laughs> just, for, just to establish a certain parity. Um, I didn't know. I, you know I, I'm an American, but I live in Europe. So I didn't know that we have substituted uh, uh, co uh, self-regulation for multi-stakeholderism. That yeah, but I, this this is news to me. I mean, I thought multi-stakeholderism was a particular kind of policy process that we in the United, meaning the United States government, accepted in certain domains of internet policy, but not others, where we have always said self-regulation was the thing that had to be done. Uh, I I was in Washington D.C. all through the 1990s, and I heard that privacy had to be self-regulatory. All aspects of global electronic commerce had to be self-regulatory. Many things were self-regulatory. The industry was going to work everything out on its own uh, because they were the closest to the issues. And because they were the closest to the issues, they knew best how to solve them. And so we wouldn't need public authority uh, or oversight of any sort. Um, so if multi-stakeholderism has replaced self-regulation, then I await the announcement of U.S. government support for multi-stakeholder policy making on privacy and all these other aspects as well. There are discussions. There are processes. When, when, yes. No, no, no. Oh, I, how could I not read Larry's speeches? You, you tell me to read them all the time. I'm talking about real, strong, effective, multi-stakeholder privacy policy, at all. But anyway, we'll leave that aside. Um, in Europe, I guess, they, they tend more to use the term co-regulation for a lot of things. And I remember last year in Nairobi, we did a panel on um, global governance together in which uh, we talked about the affirmation of commitments. And I characterized the affirmation of commitments as a kind of a interesting co-regulatory experience. Um, and Fiona got very mad at me and told me that that was all wrong and that it was not co-regulatory and that it was fully multi-stakeholder. And I, I, and I think that Fiona and I are old friends, so I could say that. Um, but the fact of the matter is, of course, that the US government still has a rather special authority relationship. And then there's the community. And um, those interface in different kinds of ways um, that I think are interesting. And that's not a criticism. 
It's 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 not a you know the the question of the U.S. relationship to the root to ICANN to the IANA contract to all these kinds of questions is an evolutionary process and uh, I'm a supporter of internationalization but I also reckon I'm also a a pragmatic enough person and an evolutionary enough person to recognize that some things take time and have to be calibrated and so on so it's not a criticism to say that something involves a substantial US government role I, it, it, it's still there and I think it's important but it's a question of having the category right for me unless you were to go through the AOC and take the United you know strike out all the bits where uh, there's an agreement between the United States and ICANN then I to me it's not a fully self-regulatory or multi-stakeholder process but that's I guess neither here nor there I'm a great supporter of the AOC I think it's a very interesting process I was involved in the GNSO Council in developing the GNSO Council's process for putting people into AOC review teams um, and I think it's a model that's potentially generalizable to some other areas of global internet governance and Wolfgang Kleinvector who we all who you know and others of us have had a uh, numerous conversations trying to think about whether there aren't ways in which traditional forms of global governance might not be if not substituted by uh, sorry substituted for but or uh, um, transition towards something a little bit more along the AOC model and I think it's an interesting question that there are a lot of things about the AOC model that I think are really quite good periodic reviews by the community assessments of how we're doing uh, reflection and reporting back and, and so on learning adaptation tweaking experimentation making it better over time these are I think all very good aspects that, that are very distinctive and obviously very different from other forms uh, of uh, governance um, I think well we have to put a word on the table and Emily is entirely too genteel uh, she 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 made references to sometimes their private actors have a good deal of influence or it was some sort of formulation like that so let's put a an ugly word on the table capture um, one of the challenges with self-regulation or co-regulation or multi-stakeholder regulation or governance whatever we're, we may be talking about is quite obviously that actors come into the process with very unequal power capabilities and um, it would take an extraordinary amount of really transparent open uh, process development to constrain that and even if you do there still are at the end of the day fundamental differences in power and those fundamental differences in power then translate into influence in ways that often are not obvious one of the most uh, difficult aspects of capture is precisely that it's so opaque uh, anybody who spends a lot of time and I say this as a great supporter of ICANN and participant in the process one of the things that that you know is quite uh, clear to people is that you know the ways in which those unequal power relationships manifest themselves is you know you you have to actually really be inside it to, to have the full sense of it of just how many forms it can take it's like a hydra headed monster you know uh, and and uh, <laughs> but but it's there you know and it's real now of course the funny thing about ICANN is uh, everybody thinks that ICANN's captured by somebody else <laughs> so <laughs> the, the, this makes it a <laughs> this makes it a unique form of capture uh, the, if you talk to the, a lot of the contracted people they will complain about the impact of the inf intellectual property interests and in slowing things down if you talk to the intellectual property interests, they'll tell you that these contracted party people are ramming things through so fast we can't breathe if you talk to the GAC they say oh we can't the government advisory committee we can't keep up with these things and uh, you know I we we had the ambassador from Brazil on the panel this morning and he you know in response to a question about the new GTLD program said well we didn't ask for this and I was like sitting there thinking wow that's interesting because Brazil has is an active player in the GAC um, and they feel that something was adopted that uh, apparently shouldn't have been or 
was not done in the right way or something like that. This was that was an interesting observation. You you may think I'm misstating what he said. Okay. Well, he you can refine it more than later. Um, my point is simply. Um, Ask you a question. Does that imply? We're, we're, we're taking questions. I'm in the middle yeah. of. Yeah. Does that imply that uh, the imbalance or asymmetry of power is a matter of perspective? Beauty is in the eye of the beholder, and yeah. maybe. I'm wondering whether that is uh, what. Or, that or is if what everybody you're thinks that that it's been captured by someone else, isn't that a perfect balance? Well, the the one th as a as a participant in the process who rep who's involved in the non-commercial users constituency, I can say we rest completely assured that if there's one thing that's absolutely incontestable is it's captured by everybody else and not us. We, we, we are the, we're definitely the, the least capturing, or the, we're, we're the most captive, how about that? Although we, we are sometimes able to weigh in and effectively impact decisions, I think, as well. So anyway, uh, just the bottom line, just, we're supposed to be doing short openings. The, the, just to put on the table the notion that power and capture and transparency uh, are all real fundamental challenges with regard to what self-regulatory or multi-stakeholder processes, things that we all have to collectively work at to guard against and develop more effective protections against. Um, and there's also the whole dimension of external accountability uh, to others who are not inside the process and how they react to things, uh, particularly when they find out post hoc that something's happened. So there's a lot of interesting questions around this set of issues. And OK, tell me exactly what the Brazilian ambassador said. I, my understanding was, I think he said, we didn't ask for new TLDs. Not right, that's what I meant. Ever said, can we have new TLDs? But it was always been part of the ICANN program. So I, I, you should ask. OK, OK, that's fine. So. That's not a major clarification. But anyway, all right, so I'm finished. Thank you. Thanks, Bill. That's great. And it, it, again, another ugly word. I, uh, a European Commission official, I'm sure many of you know, often tweets. Um, no, that wasn't the ugly word. Uh, corporatism is, uh, is his perspective. You know, who are the pow most powerful lobbies? Often it's, the, it's big corporate interests. OK, finally, and I'm eager to come to, to, to the audience soon for, for your points and, and questions, uh, but Pranesh Prakash. Thank you very much, Ian. Uh, I'm going to speak a little bit fast, uh, but not faster than Fiona. So I hope the transcriptors can keep, can keep up to pace. Uh, don't have too much time. So uh, I'm going to approach the issue uh, that Ian asked me to talk about, the BlackBerry uh, issue, that of uh, the Indian government asking BlackBerry to relocate servers to India, and not just BlackBerry. They've been making this request with Gmail and others as well. And Yahoo chat, etc. Uh, <clears throat> I'm going to uh, put out some abstract ideas about that rather than going into that particular issue uh, in, in great detail. I uh, generally think about free speech issues as uh, being located at four different levels uh, state uh, censorship or state uh, restrictions, state aided private restrictions, private restrictions. Uh, all three of these categories can be both legal and extra legal, and the last being societal restrictions, which is generally extra legal. In surveillance and privacy violations, I think that needs more nuance. And until Ian pointed this out to me, I didn't uh, <coughs> really think of the BlackBerry case as anything but state intervention directly. But uh, I realize it can be seen as state uh, surveillance or state-based privacy violations uh, or uh, in uh, privacy restrictions perhaps, uh, state compelled privacy restrictions by private actors, state allowed privacy restrictions, and uh, private and social restrictions directly. <coughs> now the BlackBerry case is one of state compelled and how it happened was through a, a telecom license. Now BlackBerry is not a telecom provider. They have not entered into a license with the government of India to provide these services. But all the operators who, uh, through which we get BlackBerry-based services, whether it is Airtel or uh, Reliance or uh, Vodafone or any of these companies, <coughs> do have these these telecom enter into these telecom licenses uh, agreements. Now, in India, the telecom license is a mere administrative device. Uh, it is not 
uh, a law that has been passed by the executive. It is not even a law that has been passed by the legislature. But if this ever goes to court, I'm very sure that the courts will hold this to be unconstitutional because many of the principles that the court laid down with respect to surveillance in the 1997 case, uh, the Supreme Court of India that is, uh, are not being followed in this license. Uh, the right to, this bring us, brings us to the right to privacy. Now, Article 21, uh, which is the article uh, of the Constitution of India that covers the right to life and personal liberty, and under which privacy uh, has gotten through, uh, through judicial interpretation, uh, does not cover corporations, uh, as most constitutions around the world, the Indian constitution, through most of its fundamental rights uh, articles, uh, you know, uh, targets state actions and state laws and not private actions and private laws. <coughs> and we can see this uh, exportation of uh, surveillance for, for different purposes uh, in copyright, uh, for instance, and and an actor that was sought to be even even enacted in a, in, in in a sense, right, through through a treaty, and that brings us to the question of do the same constitutional principles that apply to state actions apply to state compelled actions as well? And something that I found find quite interesting uh, in this regard is that the the case of the uh, Indian uh, intermediary guidelines rules from last year, where um, these rules were passed, which asked companies to enter into a specific uh, set of uh, terms of service with their users, said that these clauses have to be there at a minimum, right? Now, the Indian government, in press releases that it put out to very vigorous criticism from civil society, said that this was, uh, this was self-regulation because the clauses they picked up and put in there in that uh, in those guidelines were clauses found in Yahoo's terms of services and other uh, major multinational corporations terms of services but the fact is when a, the state does that it takes on a different role a state for instance the Indian government cannot uh, prohibit artistic nudity uh, uh, from display whereas Google can and it does in some cases Facebook can uh, and it does, but the Indian government can't, and that is clearly held in different cases. Now, uh, just want to quickly rush through a few other uh, points. I generally t tend to think in very uh, strict legal and policy and economic terms, etc. But I, I want to dive, you know, go away from that a little bit uh, and think in terms of cyborgs, right? Uh, in India, you can't be compelled to reveal certain kinds of information uh, that are uh, that you hold. Uh, so you can be compelled to give uh, a sample of your blood. You can be compelled to give your fingerprint, but you can't be compelled to speak something that is self-incriminatory that that is held in your mind. But what happens to this principle when Gmail becomes an extension of your memory? What happens to this? And now there are these apps, etc., that, uh, and and not just through apps, but but through self journals. Uh, and I and there's a particular term for this that I'm forgetting, uh, but for the constant recording of your life. Quantify okay, quantify. to quantify yourself, etc. Right. Now all this information about you is no longer in your head. All your con all the conversations you've had with people are no longer with your head. And, and you know protected by constitutional guidelines in India and I realized that uh, that the rights uh, against self-incrimination might be interpreted differently in different jurisdictions okay, but uh, these are now in the hands of corporations uh, sure they can handle legal requests better than you and usually do uh, at least the larger corporations but they have fewer incentives than you and uh, they have fewer legal recourses uh, than you because the right against self-incrimination doesn't bind them. They can't claim that right, even though it's your information, right? So, uh, and the, an important point here is that privacy generally does not sell. Very few of us actually uh, make decisions on the basis of, of privacy uh, on and which services uh, guard, safeguards that better. And self-regulation generally cannot work, uh, or at least cannot work well, when interests aren't aligned. The real problem might not be privacy versus 
uh, security because individual privacy and individual security are generally aligned. It's more a problem of societal security and individual privacy uh, that might not sometimes be aligned. But the real problem might be convenience versus privacy because individual convenience and individual privacy are not well aligned at all. And answers against state compulsion, well, we have to see and think about how principles apply to new technologies. So the fingerprint, okay, uh, on the one hand, when a fingerprint had to, uh, when, when the Supreme Court of India held that fingerprints are, are fine, that they can be collected, they meant that uh, because fingerprint will have to be compiled against, uh, uh, against the crime scene, uh, report and and that's fine. It can't com it can't incriminate you unless something else happens. But what about when a fingerprint or when a password can actually open doors? Can that be compelled? We don't have answers to these. And the, and the power of metaphors in this is very important. And I love a paper by by Professor Shyam Krishna Balganesh in which he he talks about the power of metaphors in in respect to cyber trespass. Uh, Transparency is a very important principle, and I'm going to wrap up in around 30 seconds, sorry. Uh, transparency is very important here. We need to know what processes there are. Laws are required against state-compelled surveillance, just as they are required against state surveillance. And laws are also, in my belief, uh, required against state-allowed surveillance. You can't just leave that to self-regulation because the interests are not aligned. But this is the toughest thing to regulate because what happens to reg surveillance by employers? Uh, what happens to surveillance by people on their own physical property? Self-regulation can help a little bit there, but we have to think much more deeply about this. I will end by stating something that I've stated in a previous workshop and, and continues to, to drive a lot of my thinking around this area. Uh, we have to come to terms. Uh, we have to, to come to terms with private property rights and the freedom of contract and how these two very important principles have to give way a little bit uh, when corporations start having the same kinds of powers that states have. But we can't do away with these principles. You can't tell YouTube or Google that they can't do certain, they can't prohibit, for instance, artistic nudity. You can't do that. But we have to find some kind of uh, some mechanisms to apply constitutional limitations on corporations to an extent by looking at private property rights and the freedom of contract. Thank you. Thanks, Vanesh. I, I think it's great we got cyborgs and self-driving cars into this discussion. <laughs> uh, and uh, also an important point you made, I think, about different kinds of state action, whether it's legislative, executive, how far there is constitutional oversight by the courts and by other actors. And uh, it's, a, it's a, of course, a much broader debate about how far should private parties, especially in an area such as the internet, where the private sector plays such an important role to rights like freedom of expression and privacy, how can you encourage private parties to, to protect and defend those rights? So we have 30 minutes for discussion and debate. That's good. Uh, it's, wait. It's a hard limit because people will have to get buses. Um, so I'm not going to go back to the panel because you've heard, you know, straight away, you've heard from them. What I would like to do is if people would like to make an intervention of, of if you could keep it to two minutes, that would be great. So we can get as many people in as possible. Or if you would like to ask a question, could you ask it to a specific person, please, rather than saying, what does the panel think? Because that will just cause another 15 minutes of panel discussion. Um, and also, Desiree, I'll start by asking, do we have any remote questions? No. Okay. So that may be the internet, but um, this this gentleman here is patiently waiting. Do we have anyone that can hand microphones around for us? Or we do it ourselves. We'll self-govern. Thank you. So Jesse Sowell, I'm a grad student at uh, MIT. I have a question for for Bill. Um, I have a question for Bill. Uh, can you distinguish between the susceptibility to capture um, between the the vulnerabilities you described for self-regulation and the susceptibility to capture that we see in classic analyses of government capture, of, of regulatory capture, like straight ahead Stiglerian regulatory capture. Because from your description, I don't really see a big distinction. Both are susceptible to capture. What makes self-regulation more susceptible or less susceptible in your, in your opinion? <laughs> 
It's on now? Oh, okay, thanks. I'd just like to, uh, my name is Carl Schonander. I, I work for the State Department's Office of Intellectual Property Enforcement. Um, just to uh, compliment a little bit of what my U.S. government colleague, um, Fiona, uh, talked, talked about. Another sort of uh, buzz phrase nowadays is voluntary best practices. President Obama's intellectual property enforcement coordinator, Victoria Spinell, has been very involved in that. There's been four examples, uh, one on dealing with pharmacies, there's the Center for Copyright Information, there's ad agencies and payment processors. Um, just following up, just one comment on something that you said earlier. These were not quick things to do. They were extremely time-consuming things to do. Um, and uh, they're uh, just sort of barely up and running, but uh, definitely uh, something that uh, is, is worth pursuing. One very important thing. Um, they're not a panacea. They're not necessarily the only thing that should be done. Uh, Victoria Espinel has always been careful to say that um, it's important to continue with you know, regular law enforcement activities, public education, et cetera, et cetera. But they are definitely an important aspect to uh, dealing with the issues. Thanks. Can I just ask you a quick clarification? I'm, I'm, I'm interested. Do you think the time that they took, sorry, just a quick clarification. Do you think the time they took were an essential part of making them multi-stakeholder slash participatory slash, you know, the principles of good governance, or do you think some of it was bureaucracy that might be removed in a, in a more efficient process without damaging those, those principles of good governance? No, I think the, the issues are difficult, and there are uh, competing interests, and it takes time to, to make this happen. And you've got a lot of different things that you need to reconcile. I mean, you do have to do it in, in a way that's consistent with due process, uh, freedom of expression, or you know, all of the other uh, you know, values that we, we have in democratic societies. So I think that the time was well spent. Great. We'll take one more question, and then we'll come back to... OK, Fiona wants to respond specifically. Yeah, on this point, the, the activities he's speaking to all happened in the last couple of years, two to three years, all these different voluntary best practices that the intellectual property enforcement coordinator has run. That's much shorter if it had been a traditional domestic regulatory rulemaking process. So while they were time consuming and part of the time was getting all the stakeholders on board, it's still substantially shorter than what our domestic legislative or rulemaking processes would be. And so the view in the government has been, yes, traditional regulatory regimes are subject to capture. We believe these multi-stakeholder processes have um, less, are a little bit less subject to capture, although they do have their challenges, and they are still faster and able to adapt and change with technology much more so than a legislative um, system would. In the United States, the Telecom Act, which was updated in 1996, doesn't even reference the Internet except once, and it's this big. Um, and our traditional regulatory rulemakings take a very long time. Okay, so we'll take one or two more questions, and then we'll come back to Bill and Jeanette and uh, Max, who will have points to make. Milton? Or, or, or if you want to make comments, that's fine. Yeah, can we, can we get a mic to Milton? Thanks to Zero. Yeah, this will be hard to make briefly, but um, uh, I'm basically responding to something Pranash said, and... Um, when he said private property freedom of contract have to give way when corporations have the same power as governments, I think that's um, a misanalysis, a, a not a good analysis of the problem. I, I don't think corporations ever have the same powers as governments. What I like better is when you said, uh, do the same constitutional restrictions apply to state actions and to state compelled actions? And I just want to tell you an anecdote about this tricky relationship between public and private power, which is really what is the key issue now in internet governance, and it has to do with this who is uh, issue, which Emily spoke so eloquently about. I wish you'd said some of the things you said here uh, in the ICANN context. Um, she said, why did it take so I don't long? don't think there have been any discussions about it in the ICANN I can't context. Hear you, so I'll just keep talking. Um, <laughs> um, I shouldn't have thrown out that bait, but I couldn't resist. Um, so why did it take 13 years? And the answer is actually very simple. Uh, you had a process that said it was devoted to consensus, and the status quo was something that served a particular alliance of interest groups that was very powerful. And so even if you achieved uh, half to two-thirds of the stakeholder groups saying they wanted to change that status quo, 
You couldn't move off of it because one group could always say it was blocking. Indeed, there was a point at which the GNSO actually came up with a definition of the purpose of who is, which said it was primarily for technical reasons and not for law enforcement reasons. And this two-thirds majority passed, which meant that it was consensus under the definition of the GNSO. And this consensus was literally overturned through a private deal between the GNSO chairman after pressure from the uh, governments, from the GAC, and particularly the the U.S. government, uh, the law enforcement agencies, and the trademark lobby make a very powerful alliance here. And that's, you know, that's the, the real problem with these self-governance institutions, these so-called multi-stakeholder institutions, is that when are they taken credible, uh, uh, taken seriously as making credible commitments and when do we just go outside and bypass them whenever we don't get what we want out of them? It's a, it, that's a very serious problem that ICANN has that uh, seems to just recur and recur and recur, which is why the new TLD program has taken so long as well. Emily, I want, do you want to respond very specifically to that? Uh, just to, uh, I think it's, a, it's a, um, a point that Pranesh made about, I think it was you, Self-regulation can't work well when interests are not aligned. And uh, the speaker there mentioned the difficulty, how time-consuming it was to thrash out best practices um, when you've got people coming to the table, you know, in good faith to try and actually get something sorted. But they do have competing interests. Those interests are legitimate. You know, the upside of, of consensus is that it's very, very compelling. You know, it's much more compelling and much more likely to stick if the parties themselves have come to the solution. However, we all know from experience, and I think um, Milton has, has uh, expressed that frustration and lived that, <laughs> the who is, <laughs> my goodness, for so many years, is that um, consensus is also... Uh, can a consensus process is easy to capture by the most extreme elements because if you just sit there and don't budge and don't budge you can capture that process and you can end up with no solution which is probably your preferred solution and I don't think that this is a particularly an ICANN point I think this is any consensus process this isn't a bashing ICANN um, and I'm certainly not accusing anybody in this room of doing that it's an observation Reaching consensus is hard, and it takes an awful lot of effort. Uh, if consensus isn't reached, then it's all too easy for players who are dissatisfied with a voluntary process to go behind it and seek other ways of undermining it. Um, and these are, these are definite vulnerabilities in the process. Thanks, Emily. Um, we've had people waiting patiently, so, I'll, so what I will do is... First, if Bill, if you could answer, it comes nicely to, to your question about capture of government versus self-regulatory processes. Then uh, Jeanette and Max have been waiting patiently to make quick points and pr Pranesh to respond to Milton, and then we'll come back to Wendy. But I don't, I don't want to have a quick discussion at this point because it's actually really interesting. Um, can, can't we have a, a more extended discussion? Well, it's true. Um, we have 20 minutes total. Though. Yes, okay. Well, I, I don't know that I actually made the argument that um, self-regulatory bodies are more susceptible to capture than governments. I wasn't really, wasn't talking about governments. Okay, but in answer to your question, I was intrigued by Fiona's response, which was that self-regulatory bodies are less susceptible to capture. So does, so would your position then be that um, ICANN is less susceptible to capture than NTIA or or the FCC, well, but p people lobby you. Um, uh. So yes, we've actually stated in public forum that we think things like ICANN are less subject to capture than uh, regulatory institutions like uh, the FCC, I believe. Again, if you would read one of Larry's speeches, maybe you could say that. <laughs> Larry's speeches are awful good. <laughs> they, s they solve every the keys to everything. Um, so. Is, is, is ICANN um, more captured than the Federal Communications Commission? Yes or no? Let's see a show of hands. FCC, ICANN less captured. Is ICANN less captured than the FCC? Okay. 
Uh, okay. <laughs> well, I was just looking for an example, a concrete example, re referring back to the question. Um, well, I don't know. I, suppo I suppose a, a given national government's institutions, um, depending on the country you're talking about, may have uh, more external uh, checks and balances in some cases um, than I can. You know, one of the things you used to hear all the time from people in ICANN is, uh, well, there's no adult supervision, right? Uh, you know, I mean, you know, things are being decided by the board and the legal department and so on, and, and sometimes the decisions are kind of like, where the hell did that come from? You know, uh, this is pulled out of thin air and you can't really figure out what the process was and the, you know, don't get access to the justifications that come that the board might have to offer. Um, in the case of the federal, the U.S. regulatory body for telecommunications, in contrast, I would think would feel, would, would be subject to more legislative oversight, more press analysis, more lawyering up from multiple well-vested uh, parties, um, more, more proceduralized in ways that might give it um, greater resilience. But it's an interesting point to debate. I mean, it's a very interesting question. Thanks, thanks, Bill. So if we could try to keep things very short now, because we only have 15 minutes. So Jeanette, Max, Panesh, Wendy. Thank you. I don't think it's helpful to discuss the question of self-governance versus um, public governance or regulation in such general terms. I don't think this leads anywhere. To make people trust in procedures such as multi-stakeholder processes, we need to also talk about the boundaries of such processes. What are they actually, where do they work, and what are the conditions for making them work, and where do they not work? And I think uh, that Emily's point about talking about power in uh, in the context of regulation is very important, where you have a huge asymmetry of power, perhaps self or m regulation or multi-stakeholder processes are just not good enough and they need some sort of uh, framework um, uh, that makes them at all viable solutions. Thanks, Jeanette. Max? Well, I think um, actually that's quite complementary to what uh, Jeanette just said. Um, I also think there's boundaries, but uh, still, um, I think this forum here actually has the potential to bl play quite an interesting role. So I'd like to throw out two ideas that are my ideas. They're not a Google position or anything like that. I'd like to discuss them with you in the um, spirit of this forum. And uh, one actually came up in um, a recent um, initiative by the uh, multi-stakeholder think tank we um, are part of in Berlin, the Internet and um, Society Collaboratory, where we discussed innovation in the um, Internet ecosystem. And it is the idea that um, when you have disruptive innovations, obviously you do not want to ask the candle makers or the telcos whether you can run Skype, etc., etc. So you need to get out and uh, uh, do what uh, Vint Cerf calls um, permissionless innovation. But um, having that said, of course, the, um, <coughs> you know, the, it needs to be a responsible act and you have to have a certain time where everybody else can look at it and can um, think about it, can comment on it, etc. So a deliberation process. Uh, traditionally, there was a technical term for that, and that was a beta version that you would put out for developers to look at, and people would know, okay, this is a beta, so um, you know some things might not work, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I think the term has um, been a little bit diluted, but it might be wa well worth defining in a very clear way and say, okay, you know, if, if you have a new innovation, get it out as a beta for a certain time, and then you know we have a, a process. For example, here there is an um, institution called the in uh, Emerging Issues. Um, session, which um, you know, so far is not one of the core pieces of the IGF, but might be. You know, we could discuss things. So let's take something very obvious, like face, face recognition. It's uh, upon us. It's uh, getting better and better, and nobody really knows how to handle it. I think this should be 
or could be one of the examples that um, we get together, we sit in a workshop like this, we discuss and then actually we go out and do something and that is the boundaries of what a multi-stakeholder um, uh, environment like this can do. It can bring things up, it can put things on the agenda and then you go out in the different areas and you decide and you come back and you report on it. So I think this could be a kind of um, multi-stakeholder innovation governance set up that might be worthwhile and I'd be uh, interested in your comments. Thanks, Max. Um, Pranesh, very briefly if you can, so we have time to get some comments on Max's thoughts and others. Excellent. Uh, very briefly, I'll give uh, two kinds of examples of uh, what I'm talking about in terms of restrictions and uh, one reply for why uh, just uh, anti-monopoly law won't suffice. Uh, examples for property restrictions. In the US, racial discrimination on private property is restricted. In India, uh, in the constitution, uh, the, one of the few articles that applies horizontally is untou untouchability, uh, prohibition of untou untouchability, I beg your pardon. It applies even in temples and private property when those private properties are open to the public. The European Court of Human Rights and the United States Supreme Court have both had occasions to comment about speech rights in quasi-public spaces. And what I'm asking for is not even the direct application of those rights or, or those limitations on, on states directly applied to corporations when those are quasi-public spaces. Because I don't think on the internet that's nuanced enough. What I'm asking for is is for, for deeper thinking around these issues, which I don't think currently exists in, in sufficient nuance at least. Uh, consumer in, uh, in, in terms of uh, uh, copy uh, in terms of uh, contracts consumer law which uh, is a restriction that first came about in in common law countries through tort law uh, was a evolution was was a response by courts to uh, increasing powers of companies and standard form contracts etc etc and mass uh, production of, of goods uh, has now developed into an independent body of thinking since the 1960s. And, and that's an important restriction on the freedom of contract, uh, which is recognized to be legitimate. And preventing monopolies alone would, would normally be a sufficient answer to many of these issues, because corporations obviously are very different beasts than states. But that does not suffice in an environment where network effects prevail and substitutability uh, uh, doesn't uh, exist in sufficient form. So for instance, I think monopolies is a sufficient answer when it comes to things like search neutrality. Okay, I, I, I don't really get that term uh, because I, I see easy substitutability, there are no network effects really when it comes to search engines, etc. But I don't see it as a sufficient answer when it comes to Facebook. Okay, because those two, those two kinds of things don't really exist in the same way uh, with Facebook as it does with, with search. Okay, so, I, I, so I'm not offering answers, I'm just saying that we need to really think through these issues more carefully. Thanks. Thank you, Panesh. Um, Bill, could you hand your mic back to Wendy? Thank you. Wendy Seltzer here, this time able to use a microphone. Uh, just wanted to, to speak very briefly from my uh, experience with the Chilling Effects Clearinghouse, uh, which I think uh, w we need uh, perhaps to look at some of the, the edge cases where uh, either multi-stakeholder or traditional democratic processes have challenges. Uh, we know sort of the, uh, the governmental process has challenge moving fast and uh, adapting quickly to, to new changing conditions. Uh, but has well-established due process procedural protections for uh, minorities. Uh, the multi-stakeholder process that works toward consensus uh, can often work more quickly, can often uh, reach toward uh, processes that, that may be optimal for a large number of people but can't perhaps protect against uh, tyrannies of the majority, uh, places where uh, a large number, but not all of the, the, the folks in the room can agree. Uh, and uh, so uh, over at Chilling Effects, where we see the impacts of uh, takedowns of free expression reached by sort of combinations of legal pressure and uh, private best practices, uh, that they tend to be ineffective to take down uh, copyright infringing material or to take it off the net where it can't be found, uh, but quite effective at taking down, uh, say, 
protest material or uh, complaints that have limited audience, but somebody wants to speak them and somebody can lawfully hear them, uh, and somebody or uh, lots of somebodies want to get them taken offline and exercise a uh, sort of heckler's veto. Uh, so I think we need to sort of look at those edge conditions uh, to figure out where each type of process is useful uh, and appropriate and where it's not. Thanks, Wendy. That's a great, great, great point and backing up what Jeanette said. Uh, Desiree, is there anybody out there? No, I think everyone's <laughs> asleep, uh, listening and enjoying the conversation. Well, that's, that's a nice spin to put on it. Thank you. Um, do, do we have uh, any more comments or questions? So the, the lady here and then go back. Can you hear me? Yeah. <laughs> uh, this is Athena Fraguli from the RIPE NCC. Uh, I'm coming from a you know, multi-stakeholder um, environment or community, you name it. Uh, this morning, I was in a, uh, in a session. Uh, I was attending a session. It was about uh, copyright and enforcement. Desiree was also one of the panelists. And whereas there was a discussion about multi-stakeholderism and so on, one of the panelists said, you know what, copyright, th there, are, there are experts that know how to deal with it and let them do their job. And, and this, was, um, this was, you know, weird because I, in this environment, we, I don't know, if, it's been a long time, <laughs> you know, since the last time we, <laughs> we heard about it. Um, but it made me uh, think a little bit of uh, how, how, you, how you deal with the situations. And of course, another key uh, uh, word or phrase is the capacity building, of course. And of course, it's challenging to include more and different stakeholders in your procedures. It is very challenging. And there are boundaries, of course, especially uh, there might be lack of mutual understanding, like uh, vocabulary that can be used in different ways, or uh, perceptions, yes, I know, but is this, and you don't, actually. And um, yes, it, uh, it takes a lot of effort. And I was wondering, and this is a question for the um, US Department of Commerce, in this uh, code of conduct, do you take into account these issues uh, about capacity building and uh, you know, ways to include more uh, stakeholders and how to educate them in a way? I was wondering. Can it, Fiona, can we just take one more question and then come back? So, Desiree, would you mind passing the microphone down to Vivek? Thank you. I, uh, unfortunately, this was not uh, a question, but a little bit of pontification. A um, couple of points that I think are interesting just to put on the table is that of the multi-stakeholderism I see happens in the shadow of the law. And I, I come from a CSR background, and when you look at something like the voluntary principles on security and human rights, that occurred in the background of the Alien Tort Claims Act. Uh, if it weren't for the fact that there were extraterritorial liability, you wouldn't see extractive industry companies coming together with a code of conduct on how we use force. So that's one interesting thing to think about, to think about is setting up legal frameworks to force uh, multi-stakeholderism in areas that are not susceptible to easy government regulation. The second thing that I think is interesting is that a lot of multi-stakeholderism is feeding into regulation formal regulation, and the Global Online Freedom Act is a great example of this. It basically creates a carve-out for some of its provisions um, for companies that join the GNI. Uh, so that thing's the stakeholder process obtaining force of law. My third point, I really wish we could come up with a better word than multi-stakeholderism because it's such a mouthful. So if there are any proposals out there, uh, please, please, uh, you know, they're out there. Thank you. And, and Milton, I've, I've heard you, I heard you in Oslo, I think, say something like, please correct me if I'm paraphrasing you wrongly, you know, what, what, what is it with this multi-stakeholderism? You know, it's called participatory decision making and democracy. Is that, is that a fair summary of what you were saying in Oslo, that it's, you know, the interesting things about it are not actually particularly new or 
Fiona, would you like to answer the, the question that was put to you? Um, so we actually tried, by the way, to come up with a variety of different terms and couldn't, so we've stuck with the word multi-stakeholder. We do not use the word multi-stakeholderism, though, generally just multi-stakeholder. Um, and GOFA is not law yet, it's just pending legislation, so we should make sure people don't think this is actually a system that exists yet. Um, but to answer your question, in the privacy process that we're working on, we are the convener of the process, we're not dictating or driving it, um, and we've been very clear to say that we're just convening stakeholders. But as the stakeholders have convened on the specific mobile apps uh, discussion, which is what the first process is, there was a lot of what do we do, how do we do, what are our rules, and the group self-organized, and they actually self-organized tutorials so that other people could get up to speed to understand and have these conversations. So the groups, th the people participating in the group, and again, it's open to anyone, um, have been actually taking care of this and doing this. But we in particular have been very clear that our role is not to dictate or to guide or to set standards, but really to facilitate the, the process. Wonderful. I think that's been a very good debate. I hesitate to do this, but I'll give the panelists a 30-second closing statement if they want one, but they don't have to. Um, and I'll just go around the table if that's okay. So, Bill, do you have a 30 seconds? Okay. Well, that's okay. Fiona, do you have anything final concluding? Jeanette? Max? Fanesh? Emily? No? Okay, great. So... Thank you. Thank you all very much. And we finished one minute, one minute early, which is wonderful.